Hey everybody, Ben Arnett, FOS, Future of Horticultural Science and Engineering. And today we have a very special guest, Mr. Yubin Zhang. And uh, obviously if you don't know about him, he's done some pretty phenomenal research on high PPFD output, uh, specifically with cannabis, other food crop, uh, both about intensity, spectrums, different stages of plant growth. And uh, we've also got my co-host here, Mr. Michael Howard, our mm -hmm. Chief Horticultural Officer. And uh, Mr. Alex Gerard, co-founder and chief technology officer, the uh, the brains behind all of the FOS fixtures you see. So we're here to talk a, a little bit about some of the research he's been doing and some of the stuff we've implemented here at FOS and uh, hopefully some more exciting research between the two of us uh, coming up soon. So I'm going to yeah. turn it over to, to Mr. Mike, <clears throat> our chief horticultural officer, and uh, he's got some questions that we're going to go over right now. So awesome. Mike, let's take it away. Let's jump into it. You been, if you wouldn't mind giving us just a little bit about your background, what you've done, and just uh, give us your bio, if you will. Sure. Yeah, I'm a professor at the University of Guelph um, in Canada. Um, I got uh, my first bachelor's degree in soil science and plant nutrition. My first master's degree was uh, agricultural environmental sciences, meaning look at how plants respond to different uh, stresses. My second master's degree was uh, plant physiology and biochemistry, and then my PhD was plant physiology and biochemistry as well. So that was a long time ago, and then since then I've been combining all these uh, science and knowledge is into horticulture so produce many producing plants in controlled environments uh, for more than 25 years nice. um, yeah so how was your kind of intro into cannabis when did that get started um it, it's hard to define it uh, <laughs> i would say um one decade ago um before that i I was involved in providing advices to many people because uh, University of Guelph is the number one horticulture university in Canada. So anybody had issues, they always bring to us. Even it was illegal, but it's probably legal for them. So I just when they come asking for advices for horticulture, sure. I, that's what we know. So. I visited uh, quite a few of them, providing advices to them. But about one decade ago, and then we start officially doing research on cannabis. And uh, so from there, um, my group, my lab, have been doing research uh, on how to grow cannabis, uh, mainly focusing on zuzu management and lighting all of this because that's uh, what we are good at. Um, 90, uh, 2018, that, that was a turning point in a way because Canada uh, legalized for uh, recreational use right. of cannabis. And suddenly you see the numbers of operations and sizes of operations start to to uh, increase, I suppose, and so mm -hmm. the industry at that time was really looking for talents, um, trained people. Um, uh, so, and, and I started um, to look into, you know, how how can we support this industry? We've been training uh, graduate students before that, so anybody graduated from my program, they get hired right, right away. And then so I thought maybe we should also train some people from undergraduate level. So to 2019, I started the first, I, I think it is the first in the whole world at university level cannabis production course. So I developed nice. that, started to teach 2019. And so the I only took senior 
undergraduate students and in graduate students to train them for the industry. Um, so that's how we got into it yep. and then still enjoy it. That's very cool. Um, so can you kind of dive in a little bit more just about that horticultural program and how you think it, it's benefiting growers at large? I know a lot of your research students and graduate students who have graduated are, are now doing some pretty, pretty crazy research. So it's awesome to see that in the field. And can you kind of touch on what some of your students are doing and some of the research they're doing as well? Sure. Um, you know, as I said, you know, my program is really uh, controlled environment, high value plants production. So cannabis is one of them. And because Canada was the first developed country legalized it, so we are lucky in that position. So we got a chance to work with the industry to do lots of research on cannabis cultivation. And so in a way is that we are using all the knowledge accumulated over the uh, years uh, in the whole world on producing other plants to the cannabis industry. And the same time is that, you know, when I started that course uh, to teach the students, there was no textbook. You know, you, you, if you search for internet, you can see lots of uh, guidance on how to grow cannabis. But uh, for textbook, there wasn't any. Mm -hmm. And so for teaching students, they have to uh, we have to teach them scientifically. Everything has to follow that. Yeah. And then that's why we, uh, I thought we have to have a textbook. And then so we started to write textbook uh, to include all aspects of uh, cannabis production. So luckily last year, 2022, June, we got cannab uh, the handbook for cannabis production in controlled environment, first edition published. And then so now we have a textbook for the students at different levels. And in the same time, we, we didn't call it textbook, we call it handbook, because I strongly believe that this handbook, each, each individual grower, each operation, they have to have one. Um, you don't need to read the whole thing, but if you facing any issue, pest management or uh, zoot management, anything, you can go into that book. Then I will provide you some guidance mm -hmm. and some principles yeah. to start to get started. So that way we we've been training our students our students uh, mike was asking where what they are doing um some of the graduate students for example our first uh phd student which he was the first north americans first cannabis cultivation phd is <laughs> <laughs> is now is uh, dr daring Kaplan. so right away when when he graduated, one uh, company, cannabis company, hired him as a research director or something for that company. Mm -hmm. And of course, after that, there are uh, many some other students get hired to do research and cultivation in different uh, uh, facilities as well. I don't know. I answered all your questions. Yeah, that's about. Most perfect. Yeah. Can you kind of speak on what you've seen since the beginning of getting into cannabis uh, a decade ago and how technology has advanced, how grow methodologies have advanced, just the advancement you've seen within the last 10 years? They, they are loads, uh, loads, really. Um, yeah. You know, the, we got talents in this industry and uh, many people come into this industry. Sure. In, you know, in, in the horticulture industry or the, the sector, I would say, years ago, um, as professors, we get together with uh, U.S. Pro, uh, um, uh, academics uh, all over the world. We said, 
we cannot get talented people to join us for the <laughs> horticulture. But when the cannabis industry or the cannabis get legalized at different places, or well, Canada mm -hmm. especially, well, suddenly it's become sexy. <laughs> and many people, many people, you know, plant scientists, engineers yeah. like uh, Alex, yeah. <laughs> all started to get into yeah, these Mm -hmm. This uh, industry, absolutely, and then so you see, there's a huge increase in knowledge about these plants and technologies about mm -hmm. these plants. But one thing I, I have to say is that you know we got so many people um, legacy in the legacy uh, market or whatever you call it. They've been playing these, growing these for many many years. But the, the recent advan uh, advances in the cannabis industry, I would say, is that people really started to use accumulated horticulture knowledge yeah. over many years from other crops, applying, applying this to the cannabis industry. And it's, this is a, a huge change because I'm sure you, you guys know there are mm -hmm. tons of myth over there. Oh, yeah. Tons of them. Mm -hmm. and, but in the past, because it's illegal, mm -hmm. you cannot even do research. Yeah. You have that route for education before. That's right. right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So one thing I will give you one example is that these people, the legacy involved in the legacy uh, cannabis uh, mm -hmm. market, they are not not smart. They are very smart. They are, uh, some of them also have scientific knowledges. That's why, you know, they know flowers, they need uh, phosphate. Yeah. So if you look at the, look at the market, look at the fertilizer, commercial fertilizers, phosphate is way high because they knew the plants need phosphate. Mm. But our research, and some other groups research recently demonstrated the phosphate the our industry been using is too much too much not only it's reducing the yield but also it's a huge pollutants to the environment yeah. like our research uh, we published uh, uh, last year and phosphate uh, NPK, we look at all of these. We, we use the surface response uh, methodology. We found that um, 60 ppm of phosphate is more than enough. Wow. If you go higher than that, your yield decrease. <laughs> Interesting. And some people even find lower than that, even better. But of course, it's cultivar dependent. Sure. But anyway, so there are lots of advances. The, the only thing is that, uh, you know, it, it, it's a good thing that when it's legalized and then people get opportunities to do research, to work with the industry. So we will, we provide them with guidance based on science. So the, the, the people in this cannabis production industry, they can produce these plants more efficiently and more res uh, uh, resource efficient and then less environmental damage and then also high quality, which we talked about yesterday about even lighting, you know, the consistent lighting, you can use it to, for consistent uh, quality, but we can dive into that. That <laughs> will take us even longer to talk about. <laughs> it's super cool to see yeah. the legacy growers who come from a place where they didn't have access to education but yeah. they had uh, decades of observational intelligence from growing this crop. Yeah. So now pairing that with people from other crops who have uh, a lot of education growing other varieties and then kind of transferring that over. There's, there's a lot that we took from uh, academics and then from the legacy growers and kind of bridged that gap. True. And now we're testing some of the things that they were seeing, right? Yeah. And yeah. trying to confirm. Yeah realize that maybe wasn't the best way to go about it. And mm -hmm. that's super cool to see. Yeah, yeah, I think we've got, I mean, some of our, our most successful clients that are doing large, large scale where they're running a quarter million square feet of greenhouse or, you know, 100,000 square feet of indoor. 
um, when we see like one guy, a particular client got a guy that had ran uh, vineyards for a winery sure, there you go. for 20 years, mm. scientific data driven winery grower and then they combined it with a legacy cannabis grower yeah those two got together and they took all the knowledge of the canopy city legacy guy had from you know feeding and genetics and everything else to how he could implement all that knowledge at a large scale so the guys that do it the best i mean you can't assume you're going to be able to grow a 30 plant garage grow and then go to a 3,000 plant grow <laughs> yeah and perform the same that's where you want to have those that you know that that merge of you know traditional crops and yeah. organic you know, produce, what have you, and then combine that with that legacy knowledge and experience. Yeah. And those clients seem to, to maintain their, their quality, maintain their yields and, and less yeah. dips in production. And they can quantify what's working. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you got the education plus the legacy. It's, it's a beautiful yeah. combo. Yeah. True. The, the scale up, skinning up yep. is a huge thing. You know, in, we, we always respect uh, the legacy uh, growers because sure. they have uh, quite a bit of knowledge over there. Certainly. So we learn from them uh, quite often. The, the thing is that, uh, you know, when you grow in a small scale, you can change things easily. Mm. Uh, but when you, you know, start to grow acres, acres as a grower, there are loads of things to learn. <laughs> For example, Ben and I, before this, we were chatting about light um, uh, uniformity. Mm, sure. Which is a huge thing. Because if you grow in a small area, it doesn't matter. I can adjust the lights this way and that way. Yeah. But if you grow in a larger area, it's the, 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 the light uniformity is super, super important. I, I will tell you why, but there are many reasons. Why is that, you know, plants under different light level going to perform differently. Their size is going to be different. They, their uh, transpiration is going to be different. But if you feed them the same, you have to. Because yeah. normally if you have a huge, yeah. <laughs> huge area, yeah. green area, you have to feed them the same way. Same time. So the plants are under higher light level, they already dry, <laughs> but right. then the plants are under lower light level, it's water lock. Yep. So what happens is that when it's too much water, the growing substrates hold too much water. There is not enough oxygen. Right. When there is not enough oxygen, you are inviting pithium root rot. Mm -hmm. And then so you have pathogen yeah, in it. Too, right? Yeah. <clears throat> That's right. Sure. So you, you are creating tons of uh, issues for your operation, mm -hmm. but it's just started from the ununiformed light level. Right. But you are, so then you, you ended up, I have to spray my plants, <laughs> which in Canada you're not allowed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, so you lost your crop, this and that. Right. So it's, it's a whole thing. It, it, when you're scanning up, there are loads of things to take into consideration you know when we got into this all the leds were, were well most of them were lensless and the general recommendation would be to put the light fixture very close to the canopy six inches to a foot <laughs> and that never made sense to us when we were developing it because um well the analogy i always use is like if you have a flashlight and you put your hand very close to it you, your hand makes a huge shadow if you bring that flashlight farther away your hand yeah. makes a smaller shadow yeah, yeah, and, and so when we started to look at optics for the diodes, um, you know, that we, we really focused on that to be able to put about a three-foot gap between the light fixture and the top of the canopy, mm -hmm. and then uh, use the, the focal lenses to bring your light in. the light in. That way you're crea you know, your top of the canopy is creating a smaller shadow, uh, allowing penetration to get farther in. Um, and the plant probably sees it a little bit more naturally. I mean, the sun's so far away from Earth that by the time the light gets here, it's pretty much collimated light, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we kind of wanted to replicate that. But then, yeah, you get that added bonus of your uniformity is, is spot on. And, and you don't have to hire 10 guys to raise lights all day, which was the reason <laughs> that we wanted to do it. We were just yeah. getting great hired, but our cultivation out here, we're yeah. hiring people to raise and lower lights. We're like, that's not <laughs> a grower's job. The grower should be growing. Yeah. Um, but but watt leds i was running 224 per room in a multi-tier environment so many lights to move still lift those lights like my shoulders <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's an easy fix, right? Like if you have a 600 watt light, it's easy to go, well, I got to increase intensity to get yields. How do I increase intensity if I'm already at 100% of this light? I got to lower it. Oh, sure. Yeah. But there's no, there's then giving the uniformity goes out. Yeah, there's like, yin and everything. There's no <laughs> just benefit of yeah. any other thing. It's when mm -hmm. you lower it, uniformity goes down. And, and like we just discussed, there's a whole array of other right. micro issues that are going to pop up with in uniform rooms. So big peaks and valleys, you're going to have stringers, hot spots, cold plants, hot plants, dried yeah. out plants, you know, waterlogged yeah. plants. Yeah. So it's a very easy solution to fix right out the gate and make your life as a grower substantially easier is... 1,000, 1,200, whatever you want, PPFD all the way across. Yeah, yeah. With maybe a 50 PPFD dip. Maybe. Right. You yeah. know. And I think in your book, you said you want to aim for less than 20%. Uh, you want to have uniformity within 20%, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Good rule of thumb. And in the middle, you don't want to be less than 800 on the sides. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. Similar, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. going to provide that consistency. Yeah. Yeah. Home genius is key yep. yeah, yeah. Yep. Even, even <laughs> down to everything right yeah temperature yeah. airflow yeah. Oh, everything sure. like that is going to affect how that plant's transpiring yeah and then you're going to have issues with your root zone right because one's going to be more saturated yeah. one's going to be drier and your yeah. ec is going to stack more yeah so you run into all of these issues when you don't have uniformity within your system and i think that's a big part of scaling is creating the right size room to create uniformity within your environment your lights Yep. irrigation practices i suppose yeah even yeah. your irrigation lines can't get too long because then your practice well, starts you need pressurized yeah. pressurized uh, again another issue with scaling is you go from a couple hundred plants to a couple thousand yeah you know or you're hand watering and now you've got irrigation <laughs> systems and drip systems you know after right. the pressure is going to start dying down you'll find that out the first couple runs you start messing with new systems you got to yeah. use pressurized drip tips and a bunch of other stuff to make sure that the cubes in the middle are getting the same at the front because the ones yeah. in the middle are getting the most light. So they're the most dried out and they're getting the most water and they're getting the least amount of light. And you know, then it's yeah, that yeah. whole thing about uniformity is, is key from exactly. watering to light to mm -hmm. everything. And I think that kind of segues into our 06 I light too, right? In a greenhouse setting where you're also using the sun, you're going to have differences in light levels. So that crop with our 06 I, you can tie it in to a light sensor yeah or if you say you're only getting 500 from the sun that light's gonna kick on an extra 700 to get you to that set point of 1200 ppfd right provide consistency because then your irrigation can be consistent right the light levels that you're hitting the plant in winter and summer can be consistent and you know what you're getting into because if you don't have that and you have varying light levels throughout the day well now you need to figure out how your irrigation has to change on a day-to-day -day right basis. And you got shadows from the walls and everything. A lot of greenhouses don't have transparent yeah. walls. And exactly. Yeah, cool. we did that research you just really? mentioned uh, a few years ago nice. for other plants. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. what did you find from that research? Uh, well, it's it's uh, because it's as you said, if you especially cannabis, which we didn't do that, but the consistency, you know, if you uh, produce it as uh, medicine. So each batch, you have to have that uh, cannabinoid ratio, this and that. Um, but if your light is just a uh, very, very uh, big change over the day, and it's mm. going to be difficult. Yeah. And then, so we did that research on other crop is just to say, OK, if I want to aim at 500 micromole, say, winter time, and outside, if you have that, I don't want supply, but if you have 200, I will supply 300. Right. So, so that way, also you save energy. Because LED yeah. is the one can do that. Yeah. HPS, you cannot yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. But LED, I can just dim it or rise it right. up. You, when I have enough light, I don't provide from my LED. Mm -hmm. But if not enough, I will just yeah. give the target a month. Yeah, and that's yeah. something that we've been able to kind of take even a step farther with the, the 06i and some other greenhouse equipment is we'll put it into zones so if you have like a um you know a wall that creates a large shadow in the morning or evening we can ha set up sensors in that area mm. um so that will adjust the lights differently than the lights in the middle of the, well, that's in the good. greenhouse so yeah. and because again it's all everybody's on the same irrigation lines so if they're all getting Water the same, and yeah. The same. Yeah. You want to keep, keep the DLI and yeah. PPFD the same. Yeah. The whole yeah. idea with that system was that if you were in 
you know, Cape Cod or, you know, South Africa in June <laughs> yeah. or Bozeman, Montana or Canada in January, <laughs> yeah. the yields would be the same because yeah. that was what a lot of these MSOs were dealing with was they got a greenhouse in California and they got one in Michigan. Interesting. Yeah. And the Michigan glue, you know, Gorilla Glue number four yeah. wasn't testing the same as this one. It's like, and again, if you're dealing with medicine, how can you be taken serious as a as a yeah. medical product if you're if it's, having such high dips and values sure. and consistency and yeah. quality? So it's it's yeah. one of those ones where the more you can dial in your system, and again, that only happens with very high control. Yeah. yeah. So just just on that note, uh, Mike and I discussed yesterday the intercanopy lighting. Probably, yeah. you know, if people really are gonna do microbrewery sort of style. Sure. I will supply high quality, consistent quality cannabis. Probably uh, intercanopy lighting is a must in a way. Yep. You know, yesterday we measured it. You measured it, the top 700 micromole. Mm -hmm. And at the the lower, lower even not the bottom, just the lower branches, 50 yep. micromole. Mm -hmm. Huge differences. Yeah. And the difference is eventually will cause the quality different. Mm -hmm. But if you have that intercanopy lighting, you don't need to bring to 700. Uh, as I was talking to Mike uh, and Jeremy yesterday, is that um, from some of my data showing that, um, I would say between 300 micromole to 1800 micromole, the light intensity may not have that much effect on cannabinoids content. Where but, it's consistent between that. Three yeah, right? yeah. Pretty much, right? Yeah, but if it is lower than that, and then the lower light intensity may have lower cannabinoids content. So if you are Interesting. producing a batch, the top have higher cannabinoids content but the lower one, too low light level, why is the buds gonna be loo much looser, loose? Certainly. And uh, it's not compact enough, people don't want to buy that. Hmm. And another thing is say, if you use as medicine, their content are different. Yeah. If I'm, if a doctor is prescribe it, how, how can you do that? And that's why that's one of the biggest challenge over there. Yeah. I thought I would mention that before oh, we forgot. Yeah, we, we we've actually seen. Uh, <laughs> oh yes, yeah, sorry. So we've actually seen that. So with our A3I systems, the light bars actually move. So how we kind of design our rooms is to put them over the tables, and then we turn the outside light bars at uh, the adjacent tables. Yeah. And what's happening is because they have the polycarbonate lenses on them, is it's, they're getting cross canopy, which is getting yeah. directly into the lowers and through all the. If you're mm -hmm. gapping your tables. Yeah. That, if you're yeah. gapping your tables yeah. appropriately and you got a foot to two feet between the tables. And that's yeah. where uh, um, we've actually seen some clients, um, they'll test their buds, obviously A's, B's, and C's. Mm. And if we can get that high quality light level to the lowers while still keeping it further away from, you know, maybe harmful light or heat, um, mm -hmm. some people are actually seeing their, their lowers test really, really well. Mm -hmm. As long as they get that side. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, Inflation. lower light canopy. Yeah, and so as long as they get above three hundred. Yeah, they are, they have to get above three hundred. Which, yeah. you know, as I told Mike, is that I didn't design a trial to say that's three hundred, yeah. but based on quite a few of our research on other things, I have a feeling it's probably right three hundred. Yeah. And we'll dive into that study more because there's a lot to learn from this study. Yeah. But I yeah. think one of the cool things to take away from is when you throw these lights up trying to understand the uniformity within the room and then you know target the size crop that you want so if you're reaching 1500 ppfd four feet from the fixture and then you're at 300 micromoles four feet down from that now you can say i can have four feet of production mm. while still mm. maintaining that quality mm. and then consistency within the product throughout that production space yeah so trying to hit those targets and remove the growth up until that 300 micromoles if you want consistency within the whole product yeah and then kind of working your way backwards to plan for that i mm -hmm. think is a huge resource that growers can use mm -hmm. to have consistency and less variance within their testing yeah yeah yeah, it's a good point. I don't know how many people are Looking trimming trimming upwards yep. with a light meter in hand, right? Like to kind of yeah. 
uh, or at least set your. I'm guessing most just go that. through and they look at what looks larfy, what looks unhealthy. Yeah. Let's, let's stop yeah. having Which the plant produce energy here. We don't need energy going to these little spots. Yeah. Let's bring that energy up the plant a little bit. Yeah. Produce healthier buds lower on the plant. Yeah. How did anybody doing that? Yeah. 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 I like to think Alex. Eubens like, oh, yeah. I'm doing that. Yeah. yeah. But that's important. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the things that I learned from your research that makes a lot of sense is when you're hitting your crop at a higher intensity in the vegetative state, it's gonna create smaller leaf size. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the plant's able to absorb the light that it needs, so it doesn't have to throw out big families, right? Right, yeah. So if you're doing that in veg, you're creating a structure of that plant where it's gonna allow more light to go through. Yeah. It's also creating a plant that's gonna be able to hold more weight too, right? With higher PPFD and veg. Yeah. So you're setting up a structure where you're gonna get better light penetration and a stronger plant to yeah. hold those higher yields. Right. Yeah. So as far as growers go, when you look at your, your veg parameters, make sure that you're, you're getting that type of growth because it's going to reduce labor. It's going to reduce how much you have to thin yeah, in sure your not. crop. And it's yeah. also going to help in other aspects too. And I think that's sometimes an overlooked thing in the vegetative state to set the plant up for success in the flower. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. more so for sativa type. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and can absolutely. you kind of touch on that? Yeah. Um, so if you have different growth from an indica to a sativa, how you can control that with light intensity? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, even if you have a genetic that's normally really tight internodal spacing, and it might be more prone to things like botrytis, mm what are some things that you can do to create more internodal spacing to then possibly mitigate botrytis and other things like that? What would you say? You could... well, two, well, two things. One is the light intensity. Um, if lower light intensity, normally would stretch plants a little bit. Mm -hmm. And another thing is rate to fire rate ratio. Mm -hmm. So if you give a little bit far fire rate and then I will stretch plants a little bit, yeah. I think that something super interesting, it's a little bit off topic, but you saw through research that hitting the crop with just blue light, can you kind of explain what that does, what response that does, and then the difference between just blue light and blue light with a full spectrum? Oh, uh, yeah. So that one, it's very interesting is that because in the past we always when you use LED, when you use blue, you always have blue and red. Right. So the more blue, your plants are more impacted, are compacted, shorter, compact plants. Mm -hmm. But if you only give plants pure blue, just blue, your plants will stretch like you give them far red. Really? Yeah, we done many species. We also did dug into the mechanisms, everything. So pure blue will stretch your plant. So in that case, you know, you're probably able to uh, give your plants just one or two hours pure blue at the end of the day. <laughs> and then you may get your plants open up yeah. a little bit. And uh, another thing, this is, I'm saying this, this is uh, what I'm gonna say here is not, done by re uh, research yet, but we are uh, planning to do is, you know, at the end of the day, you give a little bit longer hours pure blue. Mm -hmm. The blue would stretch the plants and then also it may enhance the flower initiation or the more flowers come out, but you know, you can have the theory or hypothesis until you've done the research, you don't know. So I'm saying this, which uh, we're going to do that someday. But to come back to your question is that, yeah, pure blue going to stretch plants for sure. Pure <laughs> <laughs> blue within the full spectrum is going to keep them That's more right. compact. So yeah, yeah. if you look at our spring spectrum, it has a higher concentration of blue in that spectrum. And we recommend mm -hmm. that until you see flower development start. So that higher concentration of blue within the full spectrum is going to mitigate some of that stretch, but it's also going to initiate flower a little bit faster. Exactly. May or may not, may which, not. which I don't know. The, the, 
the reason is coming that, soon. You know, <laughs> science is that so many things. You know, if you don't do it, you think that's going to happen, mm -hmm. but it may not happen. Because yesterday, uh, yesterday I was talking to Jeremy and uh, Mike. Uh, this is off topic, but uh, I guess you guys are free talking because when when <laughs> you guys get together, it's just I love. <laughs> to talk. Yeah, okay. So, so why is the photo period? You know, mm -hmm. everybody is using twelve hours to. Oh yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, for veg uh, from vegetative to flowering yes. stage, yeah, twelve hours covers all cultivars. So you know you're yeah you're okay. But... I strongly believe no, that's not the magic number. Yeah, it's different. Some forever. cultivar may do well longer photo period. Mm -hmm. That's my thinking. And then so I thought we're gonna do the research. Um, so we design a trial to grow plants under 12 hours, mm -hmm. 13, 14, 15 hours. So the original thinking is that we can just put the plants over there for two weeks. So we are able to see the plants gonna flower or not. Yeah. Yeah. So if the flower the plants flower at 15 for uh, hours photo period that means we are able to grow these plants during flowering stage using 15 hours okay so that's the original thinking so we started to put 10 different cultivars under different photo period 12 to 15 and then you see some of the cultivars they flower 15 hours yeah some of, the, of them you have to give them 12, no more than that. Yeah. Otherwise, they don't flower. Right. <clears throat> but one thing we found interesting, I want to tell you, is that they flower, but the bud not necessarily going to grow big. Interesting. So are you able to get the yield you give them longer photo period? So we were not sure. And so this is now published, which is going to be published very soon. Nice. And then we did another trial is, okay, so you certainly cannot just focus on that two weeks. That's easy. Mm -hmm. So we can screen, you know, there are thousands of cultivars. If two weeks we can screen these for people, they can decide what's the optimum for the period. Now you cannot do that. Right. So what we did was we choose two cultivars to grow them uh, under 12 hours 13 hours okay and guess what after we harvested them the plants under 13 hours the fresh weight of the flowers 30 percent higher than under 12. really interesting yeah but if you look at the light it's 12, uh, uh, 13 versus 12 is only 8% eight eight, increase. Eight, eight, yeah. Eight. I, was, I was just doing that math in our head because, I mean, so, we always go by increased light levels in the room. If we take you from 1,000 to 1,200, yeah. you're going to see like an 18% increase in yield. It's yeah. almost to the T. Whatever percent we're increasing light, you'll probably see in but yield. He's saying, but it's just the duration of time the increasing by an hour. Yeah. Here. Which is eight percent. Yeah, eight yeah. percent of time and yeah. thirty percent. So, yeah. so it's amazing. You yeah. know, the research. I, I've the, 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 I'm telling you this is that it's now published. We're still analyzing some of the data, but those are just so interesting. Mm -hmm. And then, so sometimes we think we know something yeah. uh, until you do it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah. So as scientists, what we do is that we only talk while we know <laughs> yes yeah. and i'm sure the light level stayed the same the same yeah, the same. yeah only photo period i'd change. be curious to see if you increase the light levels and then brought the time down match and, dli yeah match dli's almost because what we've seen too with mm -hmm. a couple guys again depending on cultivar um will increase their light so much that they'll take a 10 week strain and, and it'll finish a week early or two weeks early i think is the the fastest yeah. we've seen a, a plant so, interesting so change. based on our research the first of all is normally on other crops is if you have the same dli longer photo period it's more efficient mm -hmm. okay Makes so sense. your plants will perform better say i'm 
growing plants under 15 hours, mm -hmm. one is 10 hours. 10 hours, I have a higher PPFD. 15, I have lower, but the DI is the same. Okay. The 15 hours would do better. Okay. But having said that, in a, our research looking at how cannabis yield responds to PPFD from 200 micromole all the way to 1800 micromole, the yield response to light intensity was linear. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in that case is that if you shorten the photo period by increase the light level, if it is within that range, it may not affect that much. Interesting. Yeah. But I wouldn't, if I could use 12 hours photo period, I wouldn't go down to 10. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what I would like to think. Right, yeah. longer duration, more efficiency. So when you say there's a linear progression as far as yield based on light intensity, a lot of people will say, well, quality starts to diminish at a certain point, right? Mm. And I think that is almost contrary to the research that you've done, is increasing that light level, it increased quality in yep. some terpenes, right? Limiting yep. and immersing while yep. the quality of other secondary metabolites stayed consistent. Yeah. So not only did it not diminish quality, it increased quality. It did. Which is it did. Which is cool. And there's yeah. different light saturation points of different cultivars too, mm -hmm. right? So finding yep. out what your cultivars can hit. Sure. Yeah. But my question to you is if you're going into a commercial operation and you see that they're only using a thousand micromoles, what would you tell them? Are they leaving weight on the table at that point? Um, what would you recommend as far as people trying to achieve as far as light levels based on the research you've done? Yeah. I will answer that question. Uh, from two aspects. First is that um, you know the the from two hundred we our uh, uh, trial was from two hundred micromole to eighteen hundred micromole, and then the yield was responded linearly. So that tells you for that cultivar under that condition, the more light you get, linear increase of yield. The quality part is that we analyze the cannabinoids content and terpenes. The cannabinoids content in the, in the paper is from 200 to 1800, it's a flat nine. But if you look in detail at about 200 micromole, the cannabinoids content, there was a dip. Okay. So that's why I've been telling you, I would say, between eight, uh, 300 to 1800, the light intensity didn't affect the cannabinoids content. Okay, this is not <clears throat> only the conclusion is not only from that research alone. There are other research as well years ago in different country. They grow plants under HPS 400, 600. 900, the yield increased linearly, mm -hmm. but THC content flat didn't increase. Okay. So, so coming back is that if you are growing plants from 300 to 1800 micromole, probably the cannabinoids content wouldn't be changed that right. much. Some terpenes did increase under higher light level. That's interesting. And another thing is that the recreational, the cannabis, oh no, cannabis, yeah, cannabis, <laughs> the, the flowers quality is when people go and buy, they want to yeah. see the, the, the density of that flower. Yeah. Yeah. And then higher light level, it was increased. Yeah. So, so coming back to that 1,000 micromole, if somebody is growing under 1,000, what advice I would give? And then this is a very, very difficult question. It is. <laughs> One is that if they are growing the cultivar we were growing, and then also the, their uh, root zone environment is not limited or yeah. everything is not limited, CO2 is not limited, um, I would say, yeah, go to at least 1800. Mm -hmm. You will get 
eighteen to one thousand is that how many percent increase? Yeah. Then you're gonna get quite a big increase of yield without changing anything. Yeah. But having said that, though, it's if you are using different cultivar, some of the cultivar probably get saturation point below eighteen. Sure. Hundred. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And uh, another thing is that if you're not supplying CO two. CO2 is limiting, you may waste your money sure. by giving them high light level or your nutrient solution or the growing substrates you are yeah. using the, uh, right. If any of them are limiting, HVAC, all that. Yeah, you are wasting your money. Mm -hmm. We did um, a trial before this publication in the same facility and uh, from I, I remember it's probably from 200 micromole to 1500 micromole, the yield was flat. Interesting. The same cultivar, yeah. same place. This was an aquaponic system. Okay. So aquaponic system, we know there there are lots of limitations. Is right. of course it depends on your aquaponic system. What do you feed those fish, right? That's right. <laughs> and then, then how do you manage everything? Right. So the the flat nine was caused by there was not enough CO two, there was not enough nutrient, or the plants yeah. are not happy. And even you give them more, it's like people Can't use it, and yeah. they yeah. cannot use it. Yeah. And another thing is that. Uh, in a high light level, if you grow your plants in the uh, propagation stage um, or even the vegetative stage, um, under lower light, suddenly you give them high light level, you're going to hurt your plants as well. Oh, yeah. So there, there are tons, exactly. yeah, yeah. tons of things. So in a way, is that uh, this is again, it's off topic a little bit. Mm -hmm. I always admire Alex uh, engineers because they can develop the things doing what you, you see very efficient and smart, uh, uh, you know, the robots and then, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 everything. It's just mm -hmm. fascinating you guys are doing. Uh, but then at the same time, that horticulturist like Mike Campaign, we are doing. You know, it's science, but then sometimes you do feel it's a little bit art. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, because there are not that many factors, but it's more than enough than our human brain can handle in a way. Absolutely. You know, we talk about uh, Zutzung. We talk about lighting. And so all are connected. You know, Zutzung management, for example, I when I say Zutzung, uh, I created uh, one word, it's just zut zong, connected, mm -hmm. not hyphen or anything, because <laughs> yeah. I feel they deserve a word zut zong, zut zong. especially, yeah. especially yeah. when you grow soilless um, oh, yeah. in, in part. The whole part, it's, I call that zut zong. Sure. You have to manage it, integrate yeah. it, take an integrated approach. So, you know, you, you have a zut zong, the plants need water, need nutrient, mm -hmm. need oxygen, right. right temperature. Sure. Say just this, free of pathogens. Okay. So easy, so easy. You say, oh, yeah. <laughs> but when you manage it, if you water the plants too much, as I said, they will be short of oxygen. Right. Short of oxygen inviting pathogens. Pathogens, yeah. Mm -hmm. But... If you don't water enough, you affect, well, plants will face drought stress. And then yeah. also EC, Mike mentioned, your EC is going to increase. Okay. Everything, mm. just root zone, everything is connected. You have to manage them, take an integrated uh, approach. So I, I say this is IRM. See, everybody knows IPM, eh? when you grow plants, IPM. <laughs> yep. So I created that term, IRM, so people can remember. I like it. So integrate the Zutzung management. Yeah, you have good. to do it that way. Good. And then we are only talk about Zutzung. 
you light, we already touched upon that. Mm -hmm. You know, if the light intensity is gonna affect the zutsun as well, it's connected. So that's why, in a way, you know, I admire these uh, uh, engineers. You can do all these harvesting machines just <laughs> working perfect. Yeah. Horticulturist is that we just trying to manage all of these, get them balanced. Sure. So, the, so recently I've been uh, really uh, spending time trying to work with uh, engineers to do use AI to manage these. Smart. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, with the roots on. Uh, management there i mean what what do you end up learning about your nutrients you know what what else can you learn from monitoring that um you know as far as you were mentioning early stacking yeah. the nutrients how important like that. volume is yeah how many shots are you giving that plant you could have a two ec and if you're not feeding enough volume you're going to stack that ec within your root zone pretty heavily whereas you could have a four ec and if you're pushing a lot of runoff mm. it could be four five ec in that substrate interesting so monitoring that and, and trying to find that balance is extremely important yeah yeah so th th that's again so fitigation mm -hmm. you can use fitigation to control that right you know when EC is too high i feed a little bit less and then so the EC will come down right um if your lights everything is already fixed sure the only thing i can do is to fitigate it why is the frequency? Uh, how often I I give the plants nutrient solution, mm. and another is the nutrient solutions uh, EC. Right. If they already accumulated quite a bit uh, salts or nutrient in the zone, I cannot feed them the same. You know, you know perfect Get worse. Uh, recipe. Like if you read my book, the zone management chapter. I gave a recipe for a vegetative stage yeah. and flowering stage. But you will see I don't, don't have EC <laughs> because I, you just cannot. Yeah. As we already touched upon that, depends on your light, depends on lots of things, your cultivar yeah. as well. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And then, so I will come back to the pH is again, it's just such a simple thing, but it's so important mm -hmm. is, you know, the pH, we say, yeah, we feed the plants between 5.5 to 6.5. You feed your plants cannabis. I found that they can tolerate a little bit higher pH okay. as well, but I say, whatever the pH you, you feeding them, different cultivar, they're going to uptake the nutrient differently. So their pH, their zootzone pH can go down or go up. You're feeding them the same thing, same environment at different stages or different uh, cultivar. They're going to perform differently. Mm. One thing is probably a little bit more complicated here is, you know, plants need nitrogen. But there are two forms of nitrogen. One is ammonium form, or another is nitrate, nitrogen form. So if you give them too much nitrate, nitrogen form, the plants take nitrogen, nitrate, nitrogen form, will increase the roots on pH. Okay. Oh, interesting. But if they take ammonium form, the pH go go down. So so in a way, I'm. Giving plants 200 ppm of nitrogen, but if the pH is going down, yeah. I will increase the nitrate nitrogen feed, the ratio, and then the pH is going to come up. So that's why it's very it, interesting. It's very important to yeah. monitor yeah. the root zone EC pH, and then you can manage by fitigation. Sure. And the amount frequency the composition of these nutrient elements <laughs> so in a way it's yeah a nutrient a water it's just so simple but yeah. you there are lots of things in it yeah and you have to really balance that yeah yeah thank you for touching on that and for growers it's important to start understanding the cultivars you're growing and their growth characteristics right because yeah. if you have a room 
with a bunch of variances from like more indica dominant growth and more sativa dominant growth, you're going to have an extremely uneven canopy, mm. which if you don't have the tools to now structure the light levels with each cultivar, you're not uh, adapting them correctly as far right? as, yeah. to the best that you can. So taking your your genetics and lumping together once with similar growth characteristics and then putting them in the same room allows you to do the same thing with that whole room and get the results that you're looking for yeah whereas if you don't and you have all this variance you're steering it one way or the other right mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. a very important point mm -hmm. for growers to Definitely. keep that in mind group your crop right uh, Could, put them yeah yeah you go into some places you see the canopy like this it's <laughs> surprising how often you actually see yeah. that too or they'll, they'll set strains on tables so you know the whole table will be dedicated to it but when you go into the room the lights are all at the same height because you know they install them there and they don't want to move them and we don't want them to move them either uh we want them to group the cultivars together yeah. uh but they you know they haven't so that one side of the room, the plants are a foot yeah. from the lights, and the other side, it's four feet from the yeah. lights. So it, yeah. it, it goes back to what we were talking about, too. If you have uniformity within your light levels, but then you have a crop with a variance of three feet between each cultivar, yeah. now you just shot yourself in the foot, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, don't have, you, you don't have uniform light, 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 light levels anymore. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, true. You've got uniform true. light levels to each yeah. cultivar, but the light levels to this yeah. cultivar to this yeah, one is yeah. going to be dramatically different. This will be 800, mm. this will be 1200. Mm. And then if you don't have the ability to feed different right, right. levels, frequency, duration, EC on different tables for different cultivars, yeah. again, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So right. yeah. that same issue we were yeah. talking yeah. about where pest pathogens become more of an issue because some mm -hmm. plants are more waterlogged, some plants are secondary C within mm. their medium. Because yeah, they're all getting get fed the same. Huge yeah. variance. Yeah. Just because the cultivars you're growing in that room have such a variance. Well. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Try to get the... You know, yeah. same level plants if you can obviously stacking cultivars yeah. that are similar and characteristics and traits are is key so as we already talked is that vegetative stage in a the spectrum and light intensity both can be used to steering the plant i call mm. it as i said if the plant is stretched and then i would give higher intensity or maybe a little bit higher blue to red ratio to make the plants more compacted, mm -hmm. which that again is more the uh, metal highlight. Yep, sure. Yeah, yeah. but then, you know, if my cultivar is different, I may use different uh, yeah. uh, spectrum. Right. So if you guys find a paper really the, uh, from scientific research showing that metal highlight is for vegetative stage, I would love to read it. <laughs> is there any uh, new research or uh, data you guys are trying to to you know get done this year, or any fun experiments, research you guys are, are planning? Oh yeah, we we always doing different research, but some of the research what we're gonna do probably it's not in the time to talk yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stay yeah, tuned. We, we, yeah. yeah, as I said, it's just fascinating this plant. Yep. It's because it's. Uh, has lots of mystery there and then also it's such a high value and uh, medicinally and uh, lots sure. of things so I, I find it's fascinating to do research on this plant so I'm gonna my whole career from here onward gonna focus on this uh, plant oh, nice. just to help this industry the way I, I, I can that's, so, that's great so continue <laughs> all kinds of research yeah, yeah, yeah. but mainly my research is mainly gonna focus on lighting and root zone management and at the university of wealth um, the education program you asked i didn't uh, fully answer that question is why is that uh, i do this type of research so it's uh, cannabis production research and then so I train graduate students and also I teach that course cannabis production. So that's for senior undergraduate students and graduate students. But then at the same time, we have a, another distance uh, education course mm -hmm. called cannabis production. But that one was, have been t taught by some of my graduate students okay. before and then so it's still continue but th that one is more for 
uh, people cannot come to campus yeah. like uh, to, uh, be enrolled yeah. in our graduate study or undergraduate study. And at the same time, I have colleagues like uh, uh, Dr. Max Jones, he's tissue culture. So he's very good at tissue culture. So his program is pumping out the masters or PhD students in tissue culture. And then so we also have uh, insects, pathology people. So their graduate students are good at sure. that. Yeah. So, the, you know, the handbook was we have 10 chapters. The handbook have 10 chapters. They are all written by the uh, top researchers. And they, they really have a many experience, experience growing their plants and and uh, also doing research. So if you look at these 10 chapters, and the, the first chapter, I wrote that with Dr. Uh, Small. He published many books on cannabis. <laughs> and so we, that chapter was focused on uh, the history, the biology of cannabis uh, in a short, brief manner. And then, and then we have another chapter is environmental control. And by uh, Dr. Mike Dixon and Dr. Uh, Mike Stasiak. And then the third chapter was uh, the genetics by Dr. Small, uh, Ennis Small. And then the fourth was on uh, propagation, so it's mm -hmm. by uh, Dr. Ma uh, Max Jung's group. So right. they talk about the cutting and tissue culture, all of this. And then it's my chapter on zutsu management, and then uh, another chapter on lighting. I did that with uh, 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 David Luwolen, so he's been working with me on lighting for many years. And then, then we have a chapter on Pathogen mm -hmm. uh, was done by uh, Zamir Pongjia's group in Simon Fraser U University, and then he's the top for path pa pathogen control for cannabis production. Mm -hmm. And then we have another one uh, a chapter was on uh, pests, insect pests. Mm -hmm. That's from our university. And then we have one is uh, the canopy. Uh, management and trimming yeah. how do you make them train the plants differently sure those are done Care by control. dr uh darren kaplan he graduated he is the first phd in north america uh, yeah. yeah but he he was dr we <laughs> yeah so yeah right so he he worked on this with uh, his colleagues who has many experience uh, years of experience growing commercially so they, they accumulated all of this. And then the last chapter was post-harvest. So how do you process, how do you store all of this? Yeah. So um, so the, the yeah, our program, uh, we are fortunate enough is that we, we are the first country allowed to do research on these right. uh, plants. And then we, we, we are just fortunate. And then I'm happy to continue that. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I wanted to make yeah. sure we plugged your book too. It's it's cannabis, cannabis production and controlled environments. Correct? Yeah, so, so it's we a, put a link up to purchase that book. It's a huge resource whether you're a home grower or a commercial grower. Being able to utilize that book if you have any issues is a huge resource. So recommend looking into that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and obviously, if you guys are able to, would love to donate a couple of our A3I or Scorpio fixtures, whatever you guys want to do. And we're actually coming out with a new unit, our A3I Pro, which will have. The standard spring, summer, autumn settings mm. and spectrums in it, but it'll yeah. also come with a UV booster. So you can mm. literally just turn on UV. It's UVA. Yeah. Yep. UVA. You, yeah. you can do uh, far red booster. Mm. So just strips sure. of far red and then there'll oh. be green lights in there. So cultivar yeah. or cultivators can go in during night and actually mm -hmm. yeah. work on plants at night with the green light. So yeah. Oh, the it's flexibility little, is. Yeah. A lot of possibilities, a lot of, a lot of unique stuff for research. So I think yeah. that'd be right up your guys' uh, yeah. back rally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lots yeah. of power. Lots of power. Oh, that's, yeah. great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. The far red certainly mm -hmm. is useful because people are already proving on yeah. other plants. And if you have far red, far red doesn't do photosynthesis. It's not par, but mm -hmm. 
but mm -hmm. with far red plants do perform differently because sure. one thing is that you get the leaf stretch a little bit and then so you have the same amount of light but more leaf over there to catch it mm -hmm. and then ends up you have higher yield mm -hmm. and uv we did uh, uv research as well this is an interesting topic as well is that 1980s there was one research demonstrated mm -hmm. that increased uv thc increased linearly okay however if you look at that the flower uh, THC content was about 3%. Okay. <laughs> and then, so we did the research and then we said, that's great. Eh? If you can increase by supply UV, mm -hmm. that's great. So we did two re different research, different cultivar, different uh, wavelength. Mm -hmm. One is UVB. We grow plants under UVB three hours per day. And the dosage arranged from zero to uh, a little bit higher than the dosage they, the 1980s used. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we used two cultivars. The yield decreased linearly mm -hmm. with, with increased increase. UV yeah. and didn't have any uh, positive effects on cannabinoids, mm -hmm. which was a surprise. And, and some terpene increased a little bit. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you know, we don't know why. That yeah. one was done, the 1980s was done in greenhouse. Yep. We did in growth chamber, well, the aquaponic uh, facility. Yep. And so it's like most of the people are doing indoor facility. So uh electric the greenhouse is hard to do um, that yeah. too yeah so in a way um uv yeah don't use uv or do use uv what i would say is based on our research because our research was based on all the good things <laughs> from the literature we designed it that way we didn't see any benefit yet. Right. We actually but, didn't put UV in our lights because of that. Because of that. Yeah. So we yeah. didn't put like UV lights yeah. in the FOS, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. spectrum of fixture offerings that we have because of that research. Yeah. And, and the only reason we did is because we kept getting hounded by growers saying they want UV, yeah. UV. And we're like, we kept sending them your study. Yeah. They said, no, we want UV. We want UV <laughs> yeah. But then, then at the same time, though, one <laughs> thing I would say is that uv is useless i wouldn't say that either yeah um is that because you know uv have different wavelengths and then when you apply to it and yep. and also your growing environment so probably uv is still useful you could use certain uv at a certain time stage of the plant's development to enhance the terpene content or do something which we haven't found that yet. Yeah. So, but I cannot say no. Nope, UV is yeah. terrible. Don't use it. Well, I definitely but want to get. I'm open to that. Yeah. We'll but... have to send you a light when we're when we've got some. Yeah. The the concept behind it was a lot of. Uh, I mean, a lot of our products are nature based, right? Like we, mm. we try to follow what uh, what you find in in nature. Yeah. Um, and that's the the UV got introduced to this A3I Pro model. Um, with the intent to kind of have it ramp up and then back down in the middle of the day, much like you'd find in nature as that sun yeah. reaches, you know, straight. Yeah. During noon. Yeah. yeah. And so we don't know exactly what we're going to find with that, but we wanted to build it so that we could then run the, the research sure. and, and yeah. what we find. Yeah. It. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, all that'll be coming in the next couple of months here. So we're, we're pretty excited to find out. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. So, yeah. so in a way, yeah, our research is great. But then at the same time, it's not ex exclusive. Mm. So you will probably, if you yeah. use it right, it may work. Yeah, and I'll some fun stuff. Another <laughs> thing is that when we did this research, we did see that um, uh, powdery mildew was far less. Yeah. If you have, and that's uh, kind of what I'm expecting. It's like the uh, far red, right? Where you're not, yeah. it does, it's not creating photosynthesis, but there's a lot of other factors. Other at factors. Play. So stress response. Yeah. And yeah. That does. yeah. Yeah. And pest wow. management, yeah. And yeah. different things like yeah. that. So, but yeah. one, one, one word of caution is yeah. trial it before 
Oh, young pang ni wa. Oh yeah. Like yeah. ours is yeah. You the powdery mildew. You compare it higher UV, much less powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. We didn't intentionally to do that research because it's hard to do. Okay. But you observed that, eh? <laughs> but then the thing is that plants were much smaller under higher UV. Yeah. So in a way, so anybody wants to use that, do a trial because it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. It's easy to yeah. do. And then if it is improving certain things, hey, yeah, good for you. That's yeah. 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 Yeah.